All right, so welcome everybody. This is Brian Johnson, and today I've got a couple of special guests with me for my own team over at Canopy Management. Um, I have, uh, of course, I've got uh, Patrick Donnellan, who is our uh, Chief Brand Officer, I think is your official title, correct? That's it, yeah. Um, we'll go ahead and get a slide on there so you can get some of the background and some of the, the width as far as uh, Patrick's experience and why he is uh, going to be a great, valuable contrib contributor to this, uh, to this today's show. Um, and of course, uh, I also have Michael, now let me see if I can pronounce this right, Tizajenko? Close, close, Tizajenko. Tizajenko, okay, all right, well. I Michael was, T. Uh, yep. <laughs> Michael T, there we go, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, Michael, of course, is part of our, our brand support team. Um, and he's got some great uh, wisdom that he's going to be bringing in here too. Um, and so let's go ahead and get the show started here. Let me uh, share my screen. If I can get my computer to respond. No. Well, please. Would not be a webinar without some kind of issue. Here we go. All right, there we go. Hopefully, everybody. Uh, if you, I don't, I can't see the chat now that uh, I've opened up everything else. But uh, if anybody can see whether or not uh, the. The slides are showing here. Uh, we are, of course, talking today about Amazon compliance crackdown, and I've got Patrick and Michael here with me. So for those of you who are joining a couple of minutes late, um, we're going to be talking about, let's, let's cover why this is important to you, okay? Uh, and then I'll kind of start digging into the meat of this. We're going we're gonna to keep this quick, right? I want to be done in under an hour. So we're going to power through some of this stuff, but we do want you to be able to set up your questions and ask, uh, post some questions here that we can, we can answer. And uh, we've uh, we got a few items we're going to cover ourselves. Uh, but we want, we want you to get ahead of this, right? Um, as uh, as I show here on the cover slide, of course, is how um, what we've seen as far as kind of the oncoming wave of listing suppressions. It didn't just start, right? This is something Amazon has been doing for years. They just ramp it up each year. But this is what we're seeing in 2023 right now that is affecting. Um, a lot of brands on Amazon. Of course, with Canopy Management, we've got a pretty wide, deep view of what goes on in the Amazon ecosphere. And so we get to see all kinds of great examples of what to do, what not to do, <laughs> and of course, how to correct those that when things go wrong. So we're going to cover some of those. Um, we are seeing a, a lot more listing suppression. I don't want to be doomsdayer, but at the same time, you do need to be aware that there's a pretty good chance that if you're, that your listing has something at it that uh, may be against terms of service, you may not know it. It may have changed since you first created the listing. Uh, and of course, um, the, the, uh, you know, there's some new things that they've added on, usually from some kind of pressure from outside forces like, you know, the FDA or the SEC or some other acronym of, of American government that puts pressure on to Amazon and they, they've learned to respond or else. Um, but we're going to look for, we're going to talk about some of the, the symptoms or some of the signals you want to watch for to see, um, are you at risk and what you can check for. That being said, this is going to be the Amazon Compliance Crackdown Show. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, so we're gonna be covering as far as like triggers, symptoms and solutions. Triggers, including some of the safety, safety testing suspension for things like toys, topicals, you know, beauty items, that kind of stuff, consumables. Um, certainly uh, uh, one of the ones that's probably the most common, of course, is content violations, <laughs> which is an evolving and changing uh, pattern. We certainly have a lot of experience seeing a, a very large list of words that we think would normally be okay to put into our product listings. Uh, it turns out they're not, or they weren't where they were before, and now they're not. You know, this this just does change. Uh, and frankly, content that gets up against the law, right? It violates some, uh, usually it's some uh, fair act practice or some state by state kind of policy or uh, ruling that they have, uh, certainly trademark law, patent law, these kinds of things, right? 
we're going to talk about some of the symptoms to watch out for things like disabled ads, uh, some of the, the symptoms that we see as a result of automated re-reviews by Amazon's uh, own bots. Uh, some of the things that we see uh, while using Amazon experiments, hopefully you, you are using A-B split testing on your listings. If not, this is the year that you need to be doing that. And of course, uh, the changes to Amazon's own terms of service, including the warning language they put in there as far as like, if you do bad things here, then we're going to kick you. Uh, that kind of you know basic thing. And then some of the solutions we'll talk about as far as like what it's going to take, the process that it takes. Um, we we want to make this as... Um, not boring as possible. Um, so we're going to be talking to you know pretty high level as far as here's some things you can do for yourself. Here's some things you may need some help with, uh, whether that is by an agency team as as experienced as you know somebody like Canopy Management, or whether or not you need to seek legal help. Of course, we don't pretend to be lawyers. Actually, uh, no, I never played it on TV either. So that's uh, that's that's a no on that one also. Um, but talking about doing an audit content modification or some kind of plan there. Uh, sometimes that also means pulling your stock out of an Amazon warehouse and then resending it back in with some different things changed. Uh, and of course, what a structured case creation uh, means and why it is vitally important if you actually want to have Amazon get things solved for you in a reasonable amount of time. I know firsthand of having a, an account suspended simply just by guilt by association that took three months in order to get back. And during that three months, you run into some bigger things. I'll get into that later. Uh, that can really bite and they can hurt. Uh, and of course, talking about account reinstatement. So Patrick, Michael, what do you say we jump in here? Let me go ahead and introduce some quick right. introductions. Um, for those of you who are on, on chat, um, give me a little bit of feedback in chat as far as um, if this is a topic that you're, you're curious about, if, or if you have a current issue, um, or if you have current questions about this, just kind of give us a little bit of feedback. That way we can kind of, we can uh, customize some of what we're talking about specific to maybe what is important to you. Okay. All right. And if I have, can I have one of you guys look at the, uh, I've got the chat hidden in the other window behind the, the, the um, slide. So if one of you guys can open up the chat and just kind of keep a monitor on what comes in there. Will do. All right, let me do some quick introductions here first. Uh, for those who have not met me before, or seen one of my shows or interviews, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Johnson. I've been in the e-commerce space for about 15 years. I've been in the Amazon space for about eight years now. And I've had, um, uh, I've had the joy, the pleasure of being able to innovate in this space, certainly bring things to market that weren't there before, including the first Amazon advertising software, the first professional training course in advertising, and of course, uh, I co-founded Canopy Management about five years ago. We've now grown to an Inc. 500 fast-growing company and um, managing a little over between my training and the agency. We now manage over $2 billion in Amazon revenue. So what that means for you is ideally what we're going to give you today is uh, based off of a wide range of experience that we have, and we're going to share uh, some of the things that are going to be very important to you either now or in the future when it comes to Amazon's compliance. Um, if you want to uh, chat with me, of course, down at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the LinkedIn. Uh, I'm just at Brian R. Johnson PPC on LinkedIn. If you want to look me up, glad to talk with you. Uh, of course, I have Patrick Donnellan with me here. He is our chief brand officer at Canopy Management. And so what that means is that he manages multiple ad teams and multiple marketing teams within Canopy. Uh, you've got, you, you, let's see, you've got over 50 now as far as advertising, programmatic, and creative talent, uh, managing over 200 brands as far as our clientele. Uh, been in the, uh, the seller space, actually all three of us have been in this, are, are, are in the seller space. Uh, myself, probably for, I guess it's been eight years now, um, and recently ramping that back up again, even, even stronger. Uh, Patrick, of course, you've run your own four brands uh, across Amazon for across the last 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. You've been with us for about four years. So you were one of our uh, one of the early adopters. Sing, of single digit, employee single digit number. Well, yeah, well, so am I. <laughs> you know, so. No kidding. 
<laughs> I could be employee number one or two and still only be here for five years. So, uh, and then Michael, we're going to go with Michael T on this one, right? <laughs> Uh, Michael is awesome. So, so thank you for joining us today on this, uh, Michael. So uh, Michael is uh, one of our lead uh, brand support specialists over at Canopy Management, which means that he's handled hundreds of accounts, uh, Amazon accounts, of course. Uh, he's been a seller himself with over eight years selling on Amazon. So uh, wealth of knowledge here, not only uh, our own personal journeys, but also within the canopy realm, uh, we've yet a much wider view as well. So welcome, welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. All right. So jumping right in here. Um, just so you guys know, so on the, the Q&A, we rarely look at the Q&A. If you could use the chat. Um, I'll keep this one uh, set aside here, Fred. That way we can, uh, uh, you're asking, of course, is it recorded? Yeah, they're all recorded. Um, and assuming that, uh, um, you know, for those of you who are in uh, like New Zealand, for instance, you know, <laughs> where it might be a very late hour for you, uh, of course, we'll get that replay to you as well. Um, let's talk about uh, the triggers, the things that set off some of these red flags, right? There, there's a bunch of them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at um, uh, starting out with just safety test testing. This is one that I've personally seen, certainly um, in the, uh, I've seen it for toys, I've seen it for consumables. I don't know that I've seen it for topicals yet, but I know certainly we've got clients that have run into this. And this occurs in a couple different ways. One is um, Amazon has done a big crackdown uh, starting probably the beginning of, I guess it was about January of last year. They started cracking down. They started taking out entire product niches simply because they didn't have a current updated lab safety testing um, on file with Amazon. Well, that worked out pretty good for Amazon because of course Amazon has products of their own brands within every category. And of course theirs were, were already all in compliance conveniently enough. And so there was uh, a bunch of um, a bunch of brands with a lot of products in uh, I'm trying to remember now exactly which kind of consumable it was, but it was a consumable product and it didn't have the registered lab safety testing. Now, Amazon, if you've ever done this before, uh, Amazon certainly is requiring across multiple categories that you have different tests done, either chemical or you know, hazardous materials or ingredients um, that are inside uh, or choking hazard as it may be for toys. Uh, these have to be approved by, or I should say, be tested through an approved or Amazon approved safety right, testing yeah. lab, right? And in the United States, there's like two of them, <laughs> you know, that Amazon authorizes. Now, there's, there's at least a dozen safety uh, testing labs out there, but Amazon only acknowledges or recognizes two. And if you don't have that, then you get delisted, right? If they decide to look at your particular product niche, uh, you could get not only your own, but your entire, all your competitors kicked off at once. Sometimes now I've seen that with consumables and I saw where about 70, 80% of those brands came back after getting the testing done. Some of the testing can be expensive. It can take time. Sometimes that's just, just a decision point for a brand to say, you know what, that product is not doing as well as I want it to. I'm just not going to come back. Um, and so that can be a benefit if you are safety tested. But our point on this is going to be that you, if you are likely to be required to have some kind of a safety testing, anything that is handled by children, anything that is put on to your body, on your skin, whether it's shampoo or moisturizer, or whatever the case is, anything that is consumable that would be put in your mouth, um, all of these are going to, at some point, if not already, going to require some kind of product safety testing through an approved lab that Amazon authorizes. So I, I highly recommend, um, if you go out to Amazon's uh, partner directory for services, they'll show you as far as like, what are the approved uh, safety testing labs for different types of products and what kind of testing to be done. And have that conversation now so that you at least know what to budget for and what kind of downtime it's going to be, because you may want to get that done um, 
definitely sooner than later um, if Amazon hasn't already slapped your hand by now. And if you set if you're setting up a new uh, product, you can set up a test product to see if there's a gate on there that requires testing before you uh, so you're not all the way to the finish line. And then when you get ready to hit enter to put the listing up, they're saying, oh, you need this test and that test. Another trigger that we're also seeing on testing required testing is through a complaint or a bad review. Sp specifically on to uh, topicals where someone will say this caused an itch, it caused a reaction or something like that. Amazon will pull you down and require third-party testing to, uh, to get relisted. I've, I've heard stories of where um, a, a competitor, I don't recommend doing this, right? Because then anytime that you report somebody else, they start looking at you also. So mm -hmm. be careful what you wish for <laughs> because they know the competitors do things like the following where a competitor will buy a product and they'll put in as the review. It's like, like, yeah, this, this was great, except, uh, you know, it caught my dog on fire, you know? Um, and there's certain trigger words that the automated systems, the bots at Amazon will look for, and they are trained to use caution over reason. <laughs> and so they will immediately pull a listing if there's any kind of a review that suggests that there's some kind of a danger hazard that could bring liability or a lawsuit over to Amazon. They're going to try to distance, distance themselves as quickly as possible by taking action very quickly. Is it fair? No. Is it black hat tactics by a competitor? Absolutely. Um, but it does happen. And so things like, uh, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of words that could actually trigger what Patrick was just talking about, whether it be, um, you know, fire or poison or something that please, I do not recommend that you leave that kind of a review for a competitor. Cause like I said, they're going to be scrutinizing you just as much as they're scrutinizing that competitor. Okay. Mm -hmm. so be careful what you wish for there. <laughs> um, the, um, and that also says like things like, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, they made some claim that this product is organic and it's not organic. Well, guess what? They're going to, they're going to scan their listing and they're going to take action if they feel need. And they're also going to scan yours. So, um, uh, Patrick, do you want to talk a little bit as far as like the, the good manufacturing process? Well, there's a couple of things in here. Um, you can, if you are an in-house manufacturer and you are you are part of a randomized third-party regime like GMP, uh, you can do COA testing in-house um, for some, not all, um, requirements. Uh, one of the ones that they don't accept it for that we know of is the rule out um, testing. Uh, you have to do uh, for weight loss and uh, any sexual enhancement, you have to rule out uh, that you have certain um, certain FDA approved drugs in or chemicals in in your product, and that um, must be done by a arm's length third party. Right. Yeah. No, that makes that makes sense. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's keep it moving. So um, if you do have questions about this particular one as far as safety testing, go ahead and put those into the chat just so that we can address them really quick um, or, or at the end um, when we go on here. Um, I don't know if we have any additional things we want to add on to this, the safety testing piece of this. There's other triggers I'm going to cover here. Um, yeah, this part of it is more sort of the rolling, uh, you know, increasing rigors of getting into these uh, getting into these niches, but um, what's happened in the last, you know, 90 days is probably more about them just increasing the increasing the, the bad terms, so to speak, and the what they consider to be against terms of service and enforcing things that have always been against terms of service, and they're just now just now getting around to it. Got it. Yeah, it does seem like it's randomized. It does always seem like it's unfair. Like you can, somebody else, you'll get hit with some kind of a violation, you know, simple violation, violation of like, um, you know, images, content, which we'll get into here in a second. Um, and, and competitors 
will not you know so it's there's some inconsistency that definitely yeah, happens we but. hear that a lot but this guy <laughs> the number one guy in the you know top of page one has this all over his listing it's it's not about what's what's in there it's about what's in there when the bots run you yeah um, and some of these have seemingly been grandfathered in for years uh but if they if they run afoul if for in some way shape or form or make a couple changes to their listing and the bots rerun it um they're they're in the same they're in the same boat as everybody else uh our advice on that front would be if every if they're going to get around to everybody you might as well get the change done now and then you can be in stock and selling when that guy at the top of page one is shut down for three exactly weeks. yeah because there's going to be a massive amount of traffic that all of a sudden you're going to get hit you're going to you're going to see a massive volume spike if, if mm -hmm. you ever do see a volume spike it's not simply just because your product niche was mentioned on oprah it, it can also be because a whole bunch of players got removed for a policy violation or some kind of a sweep that amazon does uh in, in google they call it the slap in amazon they call it the sweep or i suppose it could be the slap as well uh same same thing is if you get hit by it, it's going to hurt, right? <laughs> um, terms of service, uh, as far as content that's against terms of service, this is something that is the, the terms of service. Most companies, because of the size of the terms, terms of service, they intentionally make them non-specific. They intentionally make them vague so that they have the flexibility for their, their lawyers in court to be able to say, oh, well, this word, it means this broad spectrum of things, including what you're charging me mm -hmm. with, right? So that is very much intentional. It's not like Amazon's going to come out and say, okay, here's the list of 100 prohibited terms. Because if a term is not on there that somehow violates some other law and they get pulled to the court, they want to be the, to be able to have uh, their discretion of their their lawyers in order to be able to defend themselves, right? But mm -hmm. they will take quick action on you. <laughs> so um, in order to, uh, so Amazon can use the word, I'm going to cure, cure your listing, <laughs> but you can't use it in, in your own product listing. Yeah, even, um, even the FDA compliance guide has the word content. And by the way, if you ever want to fall asleep, pick up the FDA compliance guide. Um, and read a couple paragraphs, but it, it has the word context in it, like 15 different places when it talks about disease claims. And so there's, there's just lots of words that when they're paired with something else is are bad. And if they're standalone, or if they're in the correct context, even the word disease, you can, you can get away with using the word disease, um, if it is in the correct context. Okay. Um, ingredients, sometimes that happens with, so in, for human, for, for products for humans, uh, organic is something that is actually pleased because there's an easy online registry as far as who's actually registered properly for something to be organic. Um, frankly, I have not found in my years of experience, I haven't found where the term organic or even natural really play that much into um, conversion rates and sales. Like somebody's either looking for it specifically or they're not, um, and it's pretty readily available. And sometimes it doesn't even mean what it, you know, it's supposed to mean. Right. When it comes to it things does like- does come with their own, it comes with its own certification, right? Just like BPA free and all right. those other claims, probably non-GMO is right around the corner. Yeah. Although that's, that's still allowed, so. Right, we'll see. yeah. Um, I know certainly the, uh, like I say in the pet category, you've got a lot of products out there that claim to be organic, but they don't have an online, a simple online database to police who actually is, and who actually isn't. So you get a whole lot of competitors who have uh, organic pet food, for instance, that it's not actually organic, you know, so, uh, different standard between uh, animals and humans, of course, on some of these. The false positives, what are, some, what are a couple of examples we can come up with, guys, with uh, when it comes to false positives? Um, certainly, we have things as far as, um, Patrick, I think you brought this one of the anti-terms. Uh, you're trying yeah. to say it's free of something. It doesn't have something. And that, in, you know, the bot just sees 
that something. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of there's like that's one whole class that is um that that is uh somewhat restricted or totally restricted antibiotics, antidepressants, antimicrobials, um right. antiseptics, antivirals, vaccines, obviously, analgesics, those kind of things, but anti-inflammatories, and then all of those sort of take all after the hyphen words are all now triggering so anytime you talk about a foreign body microbial or biotic they're going to come after it you talk yeah. about depression they're going to come after that as a disease i think one of the one of the big uh one of the big um influences we're playing against here is that it behooves the drug companies to turn syndromes and maladies into diseases so they can write, so they can create prescription drugs for them, which then creates um, creates a class of protected disease on on against the uh, the dietary supplements. So right. there's a lot of forces working um, against Eastern medicine like this. That can uh, this this applies to. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, variations on a word. Um, there's a correct word, English word for this, but like disease, disease, diseases, uh, those kind of things. Um, it's going to get the same kind of flag, right? You can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the stemming, all all of that. Stemming, um, thank you. Yes, and uh, and actually, um, when it comes to portions of names, there, if you're and this this goes to your comment before about the, they they always give themselves some wiggle room to look so they can go in and look at the context but if you have a portion of a name like carpal something or circu something or cardio something um they're they're going to more than likely say that implies a disease claim Right. Um, like carpal tunnel syndrome or circulatory disorders or cardiovascular disease just because you're you're giving them half the you're giving them half the word so like cardio cure is is bad on two sides you can't use cure or treat or anything like that but yeah. you can't imply any kind of disease as, as well um one of the things we, we put on there too like say boost and and boost is kind of come and gone um and come you know it keeps keeps kind of coming in and out um it was primarily used um in like supplements that would say like this is a whatever booster testosterone booster is an example right um or uh you know boost the male enhance you know male enhancement and all these kind of you know that's kind of where it where amazon came down on those because they were suggesting some kind of a benefit which you're not mm -hmm. going to do um <laughs> uh from when it comes to medical things right it doesn't cure anything it doesn't um you know, guarantee anything. It doesn't prevent anything. It's always a, this contributes to this, uh, this helps with, you know, these kinds of things. It's never, uh, you can, you, very rare can you ever claim this definitively any kind of a real benefit to, to a person. It's, um, yeah, it's, th there's a, a, like a whole class of adjectives, right, that are gray area, depending on what the next word is, what the implication of that word set is like, uh, restore, support, maintain, raise, lower, promote, boost, regulate, stimulate. What are you stimulating? Are you stimulating my, your, somebody's smile, somebody's mood, or are you stimulating their heart rate? You know, there's, there's different things that, uh, one can imply a disease claim, uh, and one can just imply like, um, like I always think about it, like if uh, there's uh, one one example, soothing sleep, right? Right. So that can be insomnia, depending on the whole rest of all the rest of the copy, or it can be sleeplessness, which is not a disease, right? So um, it all depends on uh, on the context, but uh, prevent, mitigate, diagnose, cure, treat. Those are those are sort of, those are more forceful um, modifiers, right? So right. those are, you're actually saying it does a specific thing. It has an effect on either 
a body function or a disease, those are going to get, those are going to get knocked down pretty quickly. Right. At a high, at a high level. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk for a moment about as far as like where the content is in, in the product listings on Amazon. And, and I'll ask uh, Michael, if you want to open up as far as like what you've been able to see as far as what different kind of content, I certainly have my own list too, but I'd like to hear from you next is uh, which uh, I guess locations on product listings are going to kind of be included in some of these bot sweeps for violating terms. Yeah, so um, I see it all the time. It could be all over from anywhere from the product images themselves to the bullets to even the A plus content. Sometimes they'll pull a couple words if you had, you know, anti inflammatory on, you know, one of the A plus, they might, you know, flag that. If it could be in the third bullet, it could get flagged there. Um, a lot of the times I'm even seeing it on the product packaging, which is honestly the hardest part to fix. You know, if it's in the bullet, it's in the title you can kind of work your way around it, remove it, you know, refresh the listing and, you know, appeal it. But once you have that on the product, you know, they're going to expect you to re pretty much repackage it and right. create a whole new listing. So, and that, that's, that's the problem in itself. Cause you know, you have, you're going to be losing your reviews, your feedback, all that on that main ASIN that you originally had up. So, yeah. Cause they don't simply just say, Hey, pull it, pull it, you know, relabel it or change your packaging and ship it back in or the, the same ASIN they've actually, killed off that ASIN in the process, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I always recommend just as long as you could keep any of those keywords off of the product itself, then, you know, you can always come back to it. If it's in the title, if it's in, you know, bullets, a plus, you can always redo something like that. But once you have it on that packaging, that's the real problem. Yeah. It's a, the issue is that um, they're assuming, I guess, a continuing effect, right? If you bought this for the first time, eight months ago and you've been using it for eight months and it said cures whatever on the package and then it was changed your you know the claim if should there be a claim is going to be that they bought it that first time and they yeah, continue that's... to buy it because it was curing something and even though you remove that so amazon wants to sort of kill that line so they're gonna they're gonna in fact the wording on the the, the um the wording, wording on the warning letter is if this, if the claim is, if the violation is on the label, there may be no path to reinstatement. Yep. I've even noticed they've, um, you know, I've have, uh, we've had some partners where they've updated packaging for no reasons, you know, just uh, updated package, you know, a couple of years after having their listings already created and Amazon in the appeals actually took the listings down and showed me those images that haven't even been on the listing in you know a year now saying well the original product listing had this and this claim so right you know, therefore it's not the same product yep exactly right and so i would say if especially if you're amazon only there's no reason to have any sort of salesy kind of um nomenclature or anything on your packaging the people are reading the listings they're looking at the Im they're looking at the imagery, but they're not looking at the image to read. They're looking at the image to to take the picture in. They're getting any sort of data out of all those words you have, all that copy you have. So put it there. At least you can augment it if and when the rules change or or if you're in violation already. If it's on the packaging, though, it's very hard. And like Michael said, they'll go to old iterations of your packaging if they see a change yeah. especially almost 100 percent, if that change is made in response to a, a warning letter right so that's kind of a key terminology here is that you know they're going to be they're going to be mindful because every brand every every seller account has a notes history going back to its inception of the account and any kind of discussion that conversation that you have with sellers or any kind of red flags any kind of times that you missed a metric for instance that's all in the history they can go back and they can look at that from 10 years ago if they want to um and so that history stays in there and they know what to look for you know when it comes to like oh they had a you know a content violation on their packaging um, let's go back and see, okay, yes, in fact, there was content violation. Uh, did they change their packaging? Is it a new listing? Not, they've gotten more restrict with that. I used to, uh, I used to always wonder being a very active, you know, 
you know, in my day-to-day walk and job and everything, um, I, you know, from marketing is, is, you know, all over the place for me. Right. And so I always wonder why is it that when you buy a supplement, you get the, you know, you get the bottle, right. And it doesn't try to remarket what that product does. It just says, here's the product. It's got, you know, this has got, you know, taurine in it, but, it, but it's like, here's the, here's what the ingredients, here's the, you know, the serving size and milligrams and everything and the, and, and the directions, but it doesn't go back and say like, here's what you use it for. Here's some of the things it can help with. And I used to thought that was the strangest thing when it came to uh, packaging. Uh, but these are examples, the American legal system and the implementation, the interpretation by Amazon is the reason why manufacturers don't like to put additional risk into their packaging uh, because they might be held against, you know, held it against them uh, later on. Um, I was going to suggest, and this still can work, is that if you, before getting flagged by Amazon, um, you have packaging, maybe it's got some kind of a term on it that you already have recognized, like, you know what, this one might be, it, it is pretty common. So here's one of the things that we see in practice. And Michael, you can probably back this up too, is when somebody says, oh, a listing was, was pulled because of a content violation, but Amazon doesn't say what the content violation is. It's just a very general, you know, mm-hmm. statement, uh, but the listing is still suppressed, Right. And so we, our job is to go in and find out, okay, what's the one violating term? It's very common for us to go in and look at title, bullets, images, um, description, A plus content, A plus hidden fields, back in hidden fields, uh, specification setting fields, all that kind of stuff. And we can probably come up with five to 10 questionable or likely to have caused, to have triggered the violation it could have been any one of those, right? Some of them are just like you know could be blatantly obvious, but usually it's a little more subtle. It's like, well, you know, this one is eh, maybe, mm-hmm. um, and but it's not uncommon for us to just we don't just go in and say like, oh, there's the one. We'll find you know five to ten potentially violating terms that to the brand owner they're like, well, what are you talking about? This is what you know. This is what this means. That's not what Amazon is doing. They're not interpreting. They're simply just, hey, somebody else screwed this up before you. This was the word that was used. Therefore, everybody else immediately gets the hack. This, you know, if you know, if they find it in a bot suite, um, you're seeing the same kind of stuff too, right, Michael? Yeah, yeah, hundred okay. percent. Sometimes it's very easy to catch, and you're like, oh, well, there's the offending term. And sometimes it's very hidden, where you're like. I guess Amazon is flagging this as uh, some type of medical claim or some type of cure just because of the the way the word was used. So you just got to be very cautious about it and kind of really look through the listing and see what, you know, what Amazon could be flagging it, not what you think it is, you know. One one of the new antis, well, I guess it's not an anti, but the, the whole product class is analgesics. And so what a lot of people don't understand is that means if you have the word pain in your listing somewhere, that could get flagged. Right. Again, depending on the adjective or adverb it's attached to, um, you can get, or body part, like joint pain. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's it's, proximity too. So that's something that we have to take into consideration too when we're doing, when we're doing an audit is, uh, you know, a word like pain may be in there and you wrote it as, well, this solves the frustration of, you know, a painful shoulder and the, the bot looks and says, oh, solves pain. And it's like, you're making a medical claim. It's like, no, mm-hmm. that's not what it says. It doesn't matter. There's proximity. It's, in, it's within the same content. They can piece it together however they want to. <laughs> yep. That's exactly correct. That's what they mean by context. Yeah. Unfortunately, the bots don't have brains, so they don't have context. So when they, they're just plugging in keywords into this bot, and if it says support, they're pulling you down. Right. So that's really it. It's interesting to see the evolution of machine learning, um, you know, in artificial intelligence. Amazon has had, has used machine learning for, for several years, right? 
um, that's part of their the, how the whole platform determines, you know, a, a lot of different factors and, and uses algorithms and everything to kind of understand what the intent of the buyer is in that particular moment on that particular, you know, in that particular uh, category, for instance. Um, but we're, we're seeing a lot more media coverage when it comes to new tools that are coming out uh, that have come out that gives us more visibility, more access to some of the machine learning tools, the language models, that type of thing. And one of the things that has been around for a long time in house of Amazon is the ability for them to look at an image, scan it for any kind of text. Uh, they also have the ability to understand what's in that photo in general, be able to describe, hey, you're showing a, you know, uh, there's a dog here and it's sitting on some kind of a pet bed. You're actually selling the pet bed. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a blue wall behind it, that type of thing. Um, and on the side of the pet bed reads a brand name and you have that in your main image and Amazon bots come along and say, hey, you can't have a brand name in your main image. And you're like, well, it's like, where is it? And you see like, oh, it's just like the first half of my brand name wrapped around the edge of the, the pet bed, you know, and they're, that's what they're catching. So they have the ability to look at the images and to identify, you know, parse out and identify text and identify um one of the ones that I love. Okay, this is this is a good one. So it has the ability to look for specific things. It doesn't have maybe like a super advanced, like, you know, contextual, uh, you know, vision of your images. But here's an example of but it a, might soon with AI. <laughs> well, it, well, but okay, yeah. So here's and we'll be in trouble. We had a, here's an example of one that we actually had where we had a client that was selling uh, charcuterie boards, right? And they're they selling like the wooden boards that you'd put the, the, the food product into. And these are great for things like wine parties and patio parties, that kind of stuff, right? And so one of the lifestyle images that the brand had created was a bunch of friends sitting around and they're They've got a glass of wine in their hand and they're enjoying this charcuterie board, right? With meats and cheeses and that kind of stuff, right? Amazon flags it as promoting alcohol abuse or alcohol use abuse. I think they use both terms on that. And we went back and we looked at it and we said, like, like uh, the product, you know, the context isn't there, right? So they, they shot first and they don't ask questions later, uh, mm -hmm. but they shot first and said, like, oh, no, that's in violation. Ultimately, we couldn't even explain it. They made us change as far as what that, you know, the brand had to change that lifestyle image uh, to, I think they changed it to like, like iced tea or lemonade or something like that, so that the bottle of wine uh, and, you know, the glass of wine in somebody's hand wasn't there, even though they're selling a charcuterie board. <laughs> so it's, you know, go through your product listings. And look for anything that, don't put the reason hat on. Look at your product content, look at your product images, even your video. Look for anything that, you know, if I was really, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Really tight as far as how I analyze things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, what would I pick apart as being, you know, these days it's getting easier to, you know, to learn what people get offended by, which is pretty much anything. Um, and so look, maybe the, maybe put that view on. It's like, will somebody get offended by something like that's in a photo, for instance? Would somebody, you know, in, misinterpret this if they uh, were miseducated, I'll say, uh, on a specific word and think that it's, you know, uh, it's, it's not a great way to look at your own product listings. It's kind of in a negative, almost... A, you know, putting on the lawyer hat and looking for how can I exploit this? Um, but do that before Amazon picks up on it and creates a hassle for you, right? Or a serious problem for you. There's And there's pictures and symbols that can be considered disease claims as well. Yeah. Like talk about some of the disease claims, like hearts, um, like EKG tracings, like clogged arteries, Black lungs, uh, uh, toenails with fungus on them. These are all disease fungus, claims, probably. <laughs> right? These are all disease claims um, that uh, that that can be uh, that are being implied and 
but you know, the EKG tracings is they're all, I see them all over. What's, what's the EKG tracing? Like the little, it'll be like a heart with the little. Uh, oh, that the the symbol. The chart, yeah. I got it. I see and so saying. it's um, you're making an implied disease claim yeah. according to, according to the. Um, Don't use any agency or medical logos. What's definitely, uh, that's one of the things the FDA to pick up on. The FDA has been enforcing its trademark on its logo and use of the term. Um, they've also, one of the things that's, that's added to the pressure on sellers is they've been sending warning letters out to not only sellers, but to Amazon as well. Right. So they're, they're flexing their muscles a little bit there. So yeah, the FDA, and, and then of course they're turning you know, everyday maladies into, into syndromes and diseases. So, so the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies can, can make prescription drugs. So right. uh, that, that also just sort of continues to restrict what you can, what you can say you help. Um, I do want to, uh, a good question. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the, the, a good reminder for me is um, a common there's a common concern. Sometimes it's a misconception. Sometimes it's, uh, it does actually happen. Is it anytime you make a change to your listing? That's one of the reasons why some of the grandfather listings, they don't ever change their listing because they might get caught. And, and right now, yeah, you know, maybe they've got symbols on their, you know, their main image, for instance, and they've never gotten caught or they, they're using content in their product listing. They've never gotten caught before. And mm -hmm. the fear is uh, reasonably so is that if they make a change to their listing, that uh, it'll reroute, you know, the system will re-review their content and then they get, they'll get flagged for something that, um, that they didn't catch when they made the changes. And so that is, it is valid. It does, uh, it certainly does happen. Um, but I have also seen where they, it, it's a lot more relaxed. So back in the first few years that I was on Amazon, if you made any change at all, it was guaranteed that you're likely you're going to have a problem because Amazon's always going to go back and look at your listing. Um, in the past, probably three or four years, uh, we make changes all the time. We do split testing of, of titles and images and all these kind of stuff. We, we regularly update our content. Um, a lot of people are going through and, you know, uh, using some of the, the, the AI language models in order to update their content from the 40% quality up to the 70% quality, right? Um, not as good as our content team, but it's certainly better than what you're probably, what your competitors are doing. I grant you that. Um, but it's kind of hit and miss as far as whether or not something get picked up. Usually the reason it gets flagged is because one of a couple of things. One is there's still, there's something actually in your content that you didn't ever even looked at, maybe was in some back end hidden field. And there was a word that you didn't like, that, that it didn't like. Right. Um, or like we were talking about as far as con context and proximity is, or there's some combination of words that are nearby in a sentence or a paragraph that it just connects together magically and says, Oh, that's a violation. Uh, and so it is, you have to have a lot higher scrutiny when you're trying to do a whole catalog in bulk, uh, as far as changes go, but that should never stop you from doing things like a B split testing through Amazon experiments or, uh, refreshing your listing periodically. Right. But you do need to start putting this kind of lens of what we're talking about today of how do I, if I'm going to scan through this, maybe have somebody who's not familiar with the product, who doesn't know all the things that you know, uh, knows the acronyms or the exceptions or what actually things actually mean. And, and that's something I recommend normally is to have somebody who's not familiar with the product read through and say, you know what, I don't know what this word means, or I don't understand what this the sentence says, this bullet point says, or this was confusing or conflicting. Um, that, uh, um, you know, I taught in one of my recent webinars, you can even use like chat GBT to look at your listing and look for anything confusing or contradictory and it'll tell you, uh, which is kind of cool. <laughs> but yeah, definitely have somebody who doesn't have as much, much experience with the product as you have yourself looking through the listings and looking for anything that throws them off, slows them down, 
confuses them, anything like that. Um, but also have them look for things like, hey, is that a word that shouldn't be used? Or is there um, something that is suggestive in an image that we may want to take a double, you know, double look at, right? We've also had a couple of questions about, uh, one is antiseptic. Um, that is in the list of antis that, that we've gotten from FDA. Yeah. Uh, and also treats is treats is one of those strong uh, modifiers that are we haven't seen get through. Right. Prevent, mitigate, diagnose, cure, treat. Cure and treat are killers. Yeah. Killers. Well, and even if like like for instance, um, you know, I've seen like a product that was a it was like a belt clip for a gun holster. Right. And of course, it mentions, you know, this is a belt clip for a gun holster somewhere in the content. And it got flagged as being a weapon, um, which, of course, it's not. But again, it's it's it can it can easily it's going to act in caution first, you know, to protect itself, if you will. <laughs> it sounds like the Terminator. Um, hmm, maybe Amazon is Skynet. I don't know. Um, the. Yeah, so, so anything like that has the potential to be flagged. Now, does that mean that you should not change your listing? No, what it means is at some point you'll get caught or you'll get flagged or somebody will, one of your competitors will get flagged and then Amazon will go and look at the whole niche. It's not something you can avoid through inaction, right? Best to get ahead of it, best to start testing uh, you know, especially using something like Amazon Experiments. Um, I think actually we talk about that in a future slide. We talk about Amazon Experiments. We'll get to that as far as like how you can test some of these things. But let's talk about the last trigger here and then we'll, we'll move forward here because I really want to try to wrap this up very soon. Um, we, we talked about some of the, the trademark terms, you know, FDA approved, FDA registered facility, the, uh, you know, the, the heartbeat symbol, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Some of these things that are where you're using the logo or you're making a statement. Um, now, the question that I had yesterday was, you know, there's a common statement that says these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, blah, 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 blah. I think that one is still legitimate, correct? That is seemingly legitimate. Um, <laughs> For how? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is an ever-expanding um, you know, this has sort of been a low drumbeat, you know, of, of things uh, that Michael would deal with in his everyday, uh, everyday business. And the reason for this webinar is the fact that it's been ramping up, it's been ratcheting up. And there's a couple of reasons uh, I mentioned earlier, they're sending letters to Amazon and sellers. Um, but I think uh, that Section 230 of, uh, of the Communications um, Decency Act is a big deal right now. It's in the news. Uh, there's a case called Gonzalez against Google um, at the Supreme Court right now. And it's basically testing whether Google has immunity from things that are written on its um on its uh, platform, in this case, I think it's YouTube. Um, and so, if that were, if that immunity were to fall away in its entirety, that would mean that YouTube is responsible for the content of its videos, were it to be detrimental or, or harmful in some way. Right. So would so would Amazon. Yeah. So. You know, it, as as scared uh, as Twitter and and Google are of this case falling, Amazon is obviously equally scared. Uh, they started a couple years ago with requiring certain sellers to have liability insurance, um, and now they're they're even though you have liability insurance, they're enforcing uh, they're enforcing this uh, more and more this FDA compliance guide on on everybody and you know and and i read the other day congress is now kicking around removing or modifying that that section 230 um immunity uh and bipartisan it's like the only thing congress seems to be able to agree on right now is <laughs> that they want to go after big tech so yeah. 
And uh, I think Bezos qualifies as big tech. So, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Um, one of the things I didn't put in here that, that um, no, I'll come back to, uh, actually, I'll come back to it. Um, that we, we can keep things moving because I know we're on a time clock here. Uh, it's kind of outside of this realm here, but also uh, it's the guilt by association piece of this. But um, something to consider on this too is that, um, well, I will say guilt by association. So, so because this actually, some of you have run into this. I know I was personally affected by this. I had one of my brands that that had uh, a couple of products that were pulled and actually destroyed by Amazon, uh, much to my my love. Um, because of guilt by association. Guilt by association is simply being, you've got some kind of connection to another brand that has repeatedly violated a number of these terms of service and laws and, and these kind of, in other words, they're considered to be a bad bad actor as Amazon would put it. Um, and they would, it got, they got so far that they actually terminated their account, no longer could sell on Amazon. And the guilt by association is that if you're in any way connected to that account, here's an example. Now you might think it's like, oh, I'm using this software. And so the software is the one that caused my, my listing to get this, uh, this warning, or I'm using an agency, right? And they have a guest account on my, my seller account and that caused it. Uh, as it turns out, most of the time, no, that's not, that's not it actually. However, um, it, uh, the, the, the guilt by association, it can be, I suppose, but, uh, the, we haven't, I don't think we've ever run into that in our case here, but we have like in my case, and I've seen in others where it was somebody who had violated a number of Amazon's terms of service had did it. So continue to do it so often that they finally got their account banned. They were using the same three PL warehouse as my product. And so the warehouse was using the same common, guest log into my account as they were with theirs and Amazon connected the two and said, oh, they must be in cahoots together. They, they must be uh, connected somehow. Therefore, you're, you're suspended until further notice. Uh, and they don't give you any details. You have to find all this stuff out. You have to do all the research and, you know, forensics yourself to find this kind of stuff. That's the guilt by association. So it's, it's one of those things where just because you do everything right here, Keep in mind is that you just you got to continue to just be flexible and be able to work with somebody like Canopy or just be um, keep your head well enough in order to navigate. Is that if you do get penalized, Amazon's not going to hand you the answer as far as how to solve it. You've got to go in and do your own work. You got to do your own forensics in order to find out what some of the problems, not just one, but what you know combination of problems may have contributed to that flag and solve it yourself or with the help of somebody like uh, can be right one of the things you brought up brian that just uh triggered something the um make sure we're on here for now anybody on this call should make sure that they change the uh, they adjust their return versus destroy on their unsellable inventory if it's it they, they offered the option several months back to return or destroy automatically, and they automatically put everybody on destroy. Yep. That so, actually happened to me. That's mm -hmm. when I was talking about the, um, uh, that happened also when, when things are, uh, when, a, when a listing is delisted for more than 60 days, it mm -hmm. automatically goes into, okay, we're either going to return this to, or you're going to, we're going to destroy it. And because my account hadn't been, you know, we hadn't resolved, I hadn't found the problem yet, the source of the problem, uh, until probably like day 75 or 80. Um, I got that notice and it said, hey, we're, we're going to either return it to you or destroy it. Make sure your settings are correct. I went in there, I confirmed, return to my address. Cool. I'm set. It's done. A week later, they said, we destroyed 240 of your units. And of course... I rose hell, you know, went back and said, like, like, why did you destroy it when it's clearly said, return to me? And they opened up the account and it says, destroy. What Patrick was just talking about is sometimes the, the, the system will make mistakes. It'll reset things. So periodically check things like what you're talking about as far as return versus destroy. 
Make mm-hmm. sure those are set, especially if you get into a situation where your listing becomes inactive because of a suspension. In 60 days, they start taking action and it's going to be either return or destroy. And you got to check multiple times to make sure that the settings are correct. Otherwise, it's your fault and they will not take, uh, take blame for it. Um, let's move in here really fast here because I, I, we're already going over time here. So uh, some of the symptoms, all right? So jumping in with some of the symptoms here. Um, one of the things that we currently, uh, certainly see as one of the early warning signals um, is not even a fl- uh, warning message or a flag in, in Seller Central is my sponsored brand ads or even my sponsored product ads um, are no longer running. They're just not getting impressions. Not set to pause, not set to inactive, no warning sign, none of that. There's just no impressions all of a sudden. And it's all tied to one specific, any campaigns that are tied to that one, one product. Uh, and so it took us a while of you know sleuthing that to finally figure out, it's like, oh, that's an early warning sign. There's a violation coming, right? And sometimes it can take a week before between the, the when we first seen where, hey, our ads just suddenly stopped uh, for no apparent reason to, oh, you've got a content violation, you're listing, you're, that listing is suspended currently. So be aware of that particular symptom. Mm-hmm. And there's on several of the reports now, Amazon will say eligible and ineligible. So you'll, you'll be able to see, um, you can see, have some insight into whether um, a particular product is getting flagged as ineligible for advertising. Right. Patrick, you want to talk about virtual bundles? Um, uh, One of the sort of test cases that we've seen is, um, let's say you have product A and product B and you create virtual bundle C and you've just done a cut and paste or you've pulled, uh, you've pulled a little bit of copy from each or you've done your own copy there. A lot of times, A, the bundle is newer than than the other two products, so it's going to get run by the bots closer to any rule changes. Um, And you can see that that virtual bundle will get restricted first. But if you've used if you've used copy from one or both of the of the uh, of the input products. Right you know that eventually some copy on one of those or both of those products is going to get flagged and you're going to get suspended. So it, it could be something where maybe you do a virtual bundle with all of your products just to test right now, just to see if something you think is fine or innocuous is, is, is going to be violative. Um, right. So it, it, it can be a way to test. Also, split testing, we found, is, a, is another way to sort of test new copy. They won't approve the new copy if it's violative. So um, we see that with sponsor brand ads also, where you try to create a correct. New, and maybe you've got a content violation in there and they won't approve it. And sometimes some of the, re, you know, sometimes they'll actually tell you in the sponsor brand ads, like, like, hey, that violates religious, you know, uh, freedom or something like that. You know right. I mean? You can what? test all of your bullet. You can test your bullets with sponsor brand ad copy. Yeah. If you wanted to, uh, at least short enough bullets, but yeah, it's, um, it, those no, are sort of ways you that's can kind of a good test. Hack, Patrick. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Just copy paste the, the short bullets into the short bullet. Yeah. You can every sentence of your flag. bullet, you can test in a, in an SBA and, uh, you'll know, you'll know quickly what, what is, uh, what's not going to make it through the hoops. Yeah. So the symptoms is also kind of our, our here's, here's some hacks for pre-testing <laughs> to see if you are at a higher risk. If you mm-hmm. have any kind of FDA, you know, has not been reviewed by the FDA or any kind of other, if your listing requires any kind of warning signs or, hey, this is not, you know, approved by such and such, you're absolutely at high risk for, for, for content violations. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's good to get ahead of it and start testing that. And I think these are kind of ways without changing your listing itself, things like sponsored brand ads, things like virtual bundles, Amazon experiments are a secondary way um, of testing content in your listing to see, am I at risk here before you actually make changes to your listing, right? And so that's actually, a, a um, that's great you know, to point that out, uh, Patrick, that was 
That's a good hack. I like that a lot. Um, let's see here. What else on this one? Any others, guys, we can think of as far as like the symptoms? I, I think one of the things um, that we found is uh, out there in, in the Am Amazonia, they, um, it, this is seemingly restricted to dietary supplements. Um, but the removal notifications, a couple of years ago, it was uh, this product has been identified as a dietary supplement that makes a prohibitive disease claim about insert disease here, right? So uh, about a year ago, they, 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 they went from dietary supplement to supplement consumable product, cosmetic, or topical. So they're expanding the list to things that are under the domain of the FDA, right? Okay. So, and then, and they'll continue to do that. It's gonna, it's gonna continue to evolve because uh, those kind of policies, laws, FDA definitions, those are going to evolve also. Um, Actually, the the FDA compliance guide is dated two thousand and two. <laughs> It's just Amazon is rolling toward it, right? If you have, if your listing has been removed by Amazon, you couldn't put that product with that claim on a shelf in a physical brick and mortar store. Huh. You'd never get through the retailer. Right. So it's, um, it's, it's broadening. Uh, the last one, I think we got one last week that said instead of disease claim, it said claims to be a treatment, cure, or remedy for right. insert disease. And then it said products, dietary supplements, essential oils, homeopathic remedies, and topicals. So, I mean, they're really broadening out what, who can say what. Right. So if you're claiming to alter anything on or in the body, they're coming after you eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, Tom, you were saying as far as like the, the question you had there was as far as um, listings that you've reactivated and it becomes unsaleable. Now, um, what I would recommend is that I'll, I'll put our, our site and you can reach out to, to us, um, you know, following uh, today's show. Um, just to try to get kind of some additional input from us and see if there's something that, that I, I'm sure we've got all the experience that's necessary in order to get it resolved, but um, we at least want to get some more information because right now it's a little bit, a little bit vague. It could, it could, could fall into that, you know, the product that was reactivated is now considered different than the original product. By right. On so perception. what will sometimes happen is if your product is delisted for a label claim, that stranded inventory will be segregated out as defective because that label must be changed. Right. So I would take, take ownership of that and relabel it and send it back. And you should be, you should be fine. If that's, if that's what happened, I'm assuming he meant unsellable, not unsealable. Uh, yeah. That's what I assumed also was unsealable. It's like supplement where you can't open the bottle is useless. Right. So. so let's wrap up with talking about some solutions here. Uh, give Michael a chance to, uh, to, to chime in a little bit more too, since he's usually your front man at Canopy as far as to make sure that these, some of these things get resolved. I've had to do my own work on my own brands, but uh, I think, Michael, you've handled a bunch uh, here um, across, you know, because we represent, you know, tens of thousands of products, obviously, across all of our clients, um, you know, around the world. So um michael is the most popular person at canopy management he can eat and drink for free whenever he requests <laughs> there is not a single person in the outside of being a great guy and smiles 24 7 he solves dozens of issues for a multitude of partners and clients and and our our ad team every single day and uh does it with uh does it like i said with a smile on his face so uh right. yeah it's um it's a special gift 
I would say all he wants to do is beat Amazon all day. Right. Every day. Well, <laughs> we all do, right? <laughs> um, that is something that's kind of an advantage too of canopy management is that probably I don't know it's what is it, a quarter or a third of our staff are sellers also. Yeah, yeah. We, we we rely on that heavily in the HR process. If you're a seller, it gives definitely gives you a leg up. Uh, right. Not only when you run into issues like this, generally you have has something like that in your own history. But it also, on the advertising side of things, it helps us, it helps my team. They've been in that seat. Right. So it, it, it definitely gives, gives you a different perspective. It's just not numbers. It's just not run into a ROAS or run into a tacos. It's a lot more bigger picture stuff. A lot of experience right. based. A lot more <laughs> top down. They've got their own Amazon war stories, which yes. is nice because, um, because Canopy is such a collaborative organization. Um, among our teams and across the organization. Um, and so a lot of our experiences that we have, we readily share with the rest of them. My instance that I was talking about as far as where I had lost, uh, I think it was 79 days specifically that, that my account was down and I had lost, uh, had inventory destroyed and everything just because of the guilt by association through the third party warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, that is something I shared that direct experience and how I got it resolved. Um, so, uh, we, internally, so the next time that came up, they resolved it in, I think it was probably like maybe one or two weeks as opposed to, uh, eight or nine or 10 weeks, you know, like I experienced. So, um, a lot better <laughs> results as a result of kind of the community learning and, and sharing that we do. Um, oh, uh, some of the things that we would do go through typically, of course, the first thing is to assess what the problem is, right? To audit uh, the content and the product labeling and just kind of using our lens based off of our experience going through and finding things. Uh, Michael, certainly you can you can speak a lot to kind of what maybe what your process is there um, in general. Yeah, yeah. So typically whenever I see something going down, depending on like uh, what Patrick said now that they're kind of giving a little bit more detail as to why this violation happened, whether it's, you know, um, something with uh, blood support or something along those terms. Um, it's a little bit easier for you to kind of divvy out and figure out what the main issue is. Typically, I first try to avoid the packaging. I, I pray that it's not the packaging and I hope it's just somewhere in the content itself. So typically I'll look at the title, make sure it doesn't have, you know, keywords like you guys said, like anti-inflammatory or, you know, inflammation, something along those terms, the easy ones. And then after that, we'll start going through the bullets. We'll check the bullets, make sure that those also don't have any of those keywords. The bullets is kind of where you get a little bit, you know, a little bit more difficult term. Sometimes it's not going to be so straight up and just say, oh, this is a cure to blood support or something like that. Sometimes it could be something where, you know, it's very vague, but like you said, it could be, oh, um, like joint pain or something like that. It might not be, you know, in the same back to back, but it could be in the same sentence in the same bullet. So that's going to get flagged. So I'll typically try and remove those. You don't want to remove everything at once. And then, you know, same thing with the A plus, the, the bullets, all that, um, the image itself. And then after that, I would try and appeal it. After that first appeal, you might get lucky. You might listing back up. Sometimes they might come back to you and say, hey, by the way, in you know, one of your bullets, it says this word. And that's where you get lucky. Once in a while, they will give you a rep who gives you, you know, a little bit of an idea. And then you can be like, okay, you go that's, through that. That's pretty new too. It's like yeah, you can see the idea. cut and paste, the and then there's like a one line like joint pain in third bullet and then they yeah, do the yep, rest of the yep. cut and paste, I saw a right? couple of them today and I was like oh that, I didn't even know that was going to be a word that got flagged so mm -hmm. it helps me out too so then I remove that and then I look for any of the other products I give most of the time I feel like people in the supports or, uh, or in the supplement industry right now they didn't get one listing shut down a couple of them got 10 you know five listings so then I go through all the other listings that were also you know suppressed for different reasons and then I look for those keywords that Amazon might have hinted at in that first one that I got back up to get those ones back up um so that's what I typically go for about that and then I look into a little bit more of the difficult stuff where it comes to the product labeling itself or sometimes it could be even the brand name, which is, that's the worst case scenario. If your brand name has something like, you know, remedy or something along those lines or cure or something like that, it's going to be a lot more difficult because then Amazon's going to start flagging that as it's on the packaging, but 
at the end of the day, it's the packaging because it's your brand. So that's that's really the uh, the main issue. But um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much the 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 rundown of how we get these things back going. But you know, it's a lot of time consuming back and forth with these appeals. It's if you're lucky, it goes back up within a day. Sometimes it could be a couple weeks. You know, it's really just kind of removing everything you can without completely clearing out your listing. And that I would say is the worst case scenario is you just stripping the whole listing, putting one or two words of copy just to get that listing back up. And if you get that back up, then you know that that whatever copy you had in there was not compliant and you need to slowly start adding in bullet by bullet of something that is, you know, very, very terms of service with Amazon, which, you know, now, Michael, it's, it's probably still true is um, two, two things on this. One is I found that uh, in order to get anything done with seller support, because you, uh, first of all, consider a seller support team. The, the rule has always been internally at Amazon with the seller support is that if they can't address a problem within two minutes, then to move on, right? Give some boilerplate response and then move on. Um, yeah. And usually that's because we, uh, you know, if, if a seller submits a question that then is either vague, it's not specific as far as what the call to action is, requires a rep to go back and read previous messages within that thread, it's not going to happen within two minutes. So you're going to oh, yeah. keep on getting these boilerplate responses. That's kind of where I was talking about the, the structured case creation, because you have to make it so super simple, easy for a rep to go like, oh, I understand what the problem is. I know what to do. I can do that within two minutes. Mm -hmm. You, you have to feed them happen. everything. You have to feed them everything. And every time you reply, I'm not going to say, hey, you know, I submitted screenshots of the update I did 10 messages back. No, right. I'm going to resubmit it every single time. Hey, here's what I did to the listing. Here's what mm -hmm. I did to the listing every single time. And then sometimes you might even need to get on a call with some of them and say, hey, Correct. you know, I'm just getting these automated responses. And I could tell they're not reading anything I'm saying. This is what I'm trying to get across the board. And then they might internally push it to somebody else who, you know, they jot down some notes well, and then you might get lucky and it get taken care of. You might get the same automated response back again. And then. Yeah. The nice thing is that, is that um, you go to different levels of support. Canopy has um, some pretty good back doors because of our, um, because of the size and, and the, the connections we've made internally in Amazon is that uh, oftentimes we can reach the right people <laughs> immediately, not have to go through level one support, but sometimes that's just the process, right? And so having that structured case creation in a way that is as succinct as possible, you're not writing a book because they're not going to read it in two minutes, right? You have to be able to bring, here's the problem. Here is the expected solution. You are never pointing the finger at Amazon. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they'll push back. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to make sure that it's structured properly in, in a way that actually gets action taken. Um, as Michael mentioned, of course, there's other teams. Account Health Team, you can get them on the phone. That actually is a fantastic team. I've worked with them uh, on multiple occasions in order to specific to account health problems, right? Listing, mm -hmm. listings, that kind of thing um, that allows, uh, they are much more reasonable than the boilerplate responses you get through a text chat or message uh, through seller support. A couple of things you mentioned, you both mentioned that are important. Um, first thing is being succinct, but not reliant on a chain. Right. The you're not getting the same person back when you reply. Mm -hmm. However, replying, knowing when to reply and start a new case is very important. Mike, that's like a art uh, for Michael. Um, their KPI, their seller support KPI is solving cases. So if you keep replying saying, I need, I still need help on this issue, you're hitting their KPI. They will. So when you're when you get to that ninth one, they're they're really trying. Somebody in there is really trying to get the get this thing done. However, he's not going to read the other eight emails. Exactly. So you have to give him all of the things he needs to to he or she need to uh, to to help you out. Um, and then there's the start a new case uh, because we have a dedicated staff with Michael that this is all they do. They will get on the phone. They will start cases with phone calls, which is sometimes the only way you get something, get something to have enough momentum to get, to get done and get through in the end. 
Yeah. So that's all about that case creation art that uh, having a dedicated team that that's all they do is, uh, is a big deal for us. Like I said, Michael doesn't pay for anything. Um, one of the things uh, I was going to add on here, and then there's an additional question that Ali had asked, um, is I, I specifically on the last bullet point, I, I talked about submitting a seller supports ticket or escalation to request um, a review of the content changes that you made um, for and reinstatement. Just making the changes to the content, to the listing, is not going to automatically trigger being pulled out of suspension. You actually have to request they go through that. That's still the case, right, Michael? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, typically, yeah. I even screenshot it sometimes showing them that, you know, I removed some of those keywords. I'll even put like control F, type in that keyword that they might have flagged, show that it's not there anymore or it's only above the edit field, but you'll see on the edit field itself, it's missing. So I even, you know, I'll even point arrow, say, hey, I did this update. This has been removed. Please push these through, push these edits through before rerunning this listing and, you know, looking through it. And then you might even have to do a flat file update and, you know, just to get those things across the board and say, hey, here's my batch ID. You know, I did the updates. Can you please rerun this? And then, you know, they'll see, they'll see the updates at that point. Yeah. No, Better than sure. just saying, hey, I updated it. Because, you know. Yeah. And don't make them work at all. Just yeah. Just, yeah. They can, yeah, they can easily just dump and give you a boilerplate response and they can close three other tickets in the same amount of time that they that you're making them work in order to solve yours. Because like Patrick said, is like if they're if they're getting charged, if their quota is to close tickets uh, and you make them work, then they're just gonna pass the buck down to somebody else, you know, on the team. Um one of the things that uh, Ali was asking about as far as like um, if we had launched products FBM, is it advisable to rework the listings? then submit for FBA approval. Now, I haven't seen a need to do a different listing for FBM as I would for FBA because the content is still on Amazon. In other words, they both have to comply. Um, as opposed to you're saying converting it from FBM to an FBA listing, or do you need to start a new listing? Uh, I generally have both because I wanna have um, if I'm going backup. to ship in stock for FBA, I want to have that as the FBA stock and I want to have the FBM as my backup in case some pandemic thing or some other, you know, warehouse fire, whatever the case is, creates a situation where my FBA stock is out and they can't replenish in the same time that I can ship out from my own warehouse. So I'll usually have both. One is a backup. But they, but the, the, the FBM being up and running is means that your listing is so far in good graces. Yeah. And even so, even when, if you already live FBM at that point, you're only re-adding an ASIN. You're not creating new content. You're not refreshing any of that content on there. You're just, you know, adding that same ASIN. So then at the end of the day, you might have a new SKU on it. You have your FBA SKU, your FBM. So they'll both be active. There's no issue on that. Okay, so then she she's clarifying that. So, so if claim was on the product, do you have to start a new listing? Yes. yes. Yep, that, that's ASIN. where Amazon's been hitting a lot of the the uh, you know supplements lately is because the claim is on the actual product itself. On the package itself. So, yep, yeah. on the package itself. So they're they're going to request that you create a whole new ASIN, and at that point, yep, you're just creating a new listing. Yeah. Now, yeah. you may want to, if you have not gotten flagged and you've got a supplement, let's say, and you know that you've got a word, you know, on the back of the front of that label, um, you could always, you know, there's always Photoshop in order to be able to edit the digital image that you show up on your product listing. Um, now, as we talked about before, obviously, is that might buy you some time, but it's not a guarantee that they won't come back at some point and say, we know what you had before and yep. we scanned it and we, we found it. Uh, you just uploaded a new image, but you didn't change anything in your product, in your FBA, in the actual product that's sitting in our warehouse. We can go check. Um, you know, obviously they've got that kind of effect. So it's, it's more of a uh, editing an image to try to avoid being caught. Yes, you can do that. It's not a guarantee, but it also may, avoid you a little bit of pain in the near future. 
<laughs> it is. It, it's been less success, less and less successful in this current regime of shutting people down. Is it? They have been not only looking at late. They've been looking at label changes. Yeah, and going like going back in the label uh, change history. Okay. Do you want to like cover your eyes now and deal with a massive fire later, or do you want to start fixing it now, create a new listing, maybe get a couple reviews in? before that other listing eventually does get shut down because of that claim, you know? Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and put up as far as like just our, you know, our kind of our splash page, because obviously this whole show is put on by Canopy. We, we're most known, of course, for our advertising and our marketing and conversion rate optimization, some of our superpowers that we have. But obviously there are some additional services like what we're talking about today, the things like, like Michael gets to, uh, gets to work on on a daily basis where we want to make sure that uh, our clients have the best access to anything that's going to help them to prevent them from being uh, from growing their sales from running any kind of resistance or bottlenecks. Um, and so this is one of the, the side services that we don't publicly offer. I don't consider it a superpower, but we've gotten really good at it because of the experience that we have across all of our, our clients. And so um, our site, of course, canopymanagement.com, you can go out and you can request a consult, whether that is for your advertising, your marketing, or in this case, for compliance, right? So let us know um, on that. Uh, but I wanted to put this up there just so that you know where to go, right? Um, I also put into the, the chat thread, my direct email, if you choose to, if that's your preferred method of getting a hold of us, I'm okay with you reaching out to me directly. It's just brian at canopymanagement.com. Um, uh, Matthew actually threw in another question over in Q&A. We'll try to take this one, maybe one extra one if it comes in uh, to kind of wrap things up with some closing thoughts. Uh, Matthew's asking, he's like, what can we do if Amazon is saying incorrectly that our product is a prescription drug? Uh, as I mentioned early, don't, uh, earlier, don't ever point the finger at Amazon. For legal reasons, they can't accept liability, even if they know perfectly well it was their fault, right? It puts them at liability by, by say, acknowledging it's like, yeah, you're right. They can't do, they, they don't want to do that. They're told not to do that, right? So don't ever take the position of, hey, you're wrong. Uh, this isn't it. You simply, I've done it where I have not even changed the listing. Now they may have, may have gotten more savvy on this. I've gone and changed the listing and then resubmitted and said, okay, the listing is updated. And then I got, cool. Yeah, it's, it's approved. It's like, mm -hmm. I didn't change a thing, right? It's just triggered a manual review by human to look at and say, yeah, it looks fine to me. It wasn't automatically flagged. So uh, consider that, Matthew. Um, I'm sure there's other things, Michael, that you might be able to recommend or that you've seen yeah. Yeah. where they're clearly mislabeling or mis, uh, you know, categorizing my product um, that we've had to work around. And usually that's the case of how the case is submitted or how it's escalated, right? Yeah, another thing I could always recommend is typically it could be something where they're just thinking it has an ingredient it doesn't, where you might just need to put, you know, an image of the ingredients on one of your image carousels in the main image and just send them a screenshot and say, hey, this is the ingredient list. And they might say, oh, okay, there's no prescription drug in there. Okay. And also, if they specifically delineate what drug that they're saying that, that your product is, you could always get a COA rule out. You can get a certificate of analysis that says your product doesn't contain this chemical, this, this pharmaceutical agent, and, and submit that. That's, that's weeks down, though. Right. Let me, let me take this one last question. Brian Yankee's got a question here that it's a little bit out of scope for what we're talking about, but I like the question, so I'm curious if we have, if we know the answer. I know we do things that we've got like a, you know, one other one of our side service courses, we do uh, revenue recovery, um, you know, some of these kind of refunds and that kind of stuff. But Brian's asking, he says, uh, do you also work with reclaiming funds that have been held by Amazon from a store deactivation? I, as soon as I hear something like that, I immediately think of uh, when, when somebody like PayPal holds your funds, if you're in e-commerce, you know perfectly well, you'll never see that again. Um, mm -hmm. I had, I don't know, 30, 35 grand taken by PayPal um, 
just because they could. Um, not, not because I was actually in violation, but because they could uh, as a precaution. Um, so the question uh, that Brian's got is it, if your store gets deactivated, now there's a lot we don't know why it was deactivated, right? But have we ever seen, uh, seen a brand reclaim funds that were seized or held by Amazon as a result of any kind of deactivation? Um, I, I've only seen like the hold back where they're, where you're, you're just, uh, temporarily hold back. Yeah. And, and generally that's automated, it's automated. So as soon as you get past the time or get past a certain level of sales, they release it. Um, I would say this is probably, uh, I mean, our, I, we could ask our team if this is something we would, we could, uh, we could attempt. Um, it sounds a little Sounds like I would call my attorney. <laughs> that might still be involved. Uh, Brian, right. reach out to me. Same spelling of your name, Brian, at canopymanagement.com. I'll see if I can pass it over to other departments within our team and see if anybody's seen uh, any kind of solutions or experience in that particular case. I'll probably need to get some additional information from you. But uh, yeah, reach out to me and um, we'll, we'll see here. Um, oh, uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. One last question. Ali, you've got the last question. Uh, is it possible to merge an old ASIN to a new ASIN? Um, I'm going to say no initially on that one, but so reviews migrate to the new um, to the new ASIN or is the old ASIN locked due to compliance? Well, there's, there's two challenges on that. One is Amazon doesn't generally just say, oh, we're just going to move over your product over to this new ASIN. Um, but you're asking more specifically as far as the reviews go. I don't know if they do that. Now, given, given the last, what is it? What was it? The, who was it? The SEC that came down on the, the child, uh, the child uh, product manipulation as far as reviews? Like piggybacking off of reviews of, of one, uh, one it was product. the FCC. FCC, okay. Yeah. So there's a, there's there's new enforcement that came down from SEC on Amazon regarding uh, child ASINs underneath the same parent, kind of riding on the coattails of shared reviews, and they're saying Amazon, you can't do that anymore. Um, and so, if they were to transfer the reviews, it probably have to be because it's part of a child, but. I would say that's unlikely at this point. What do you guys think? Yeah, especially if it's already if it's already a dead listing and they they completely shut it down. Even when you try to do a flat file, it'll say that this product is locked and it'll give you an error code right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, she she did mention locked, so good good mm -hmm. chance that that one's kind of a uh, yeah on arrival. <laughs> so yeah, they. I mean, it, they're shutting them down, uh, particularly for label claims. They want that product to die. Yeah. Reviews, everything. They just they really want it gone. That because the earlier they can get away from the legal hassle of remember, it. Yeah, they're protecting themselves from liability. So yeah. if, if this thing were to come to, to come back to life, that would mean reviews and a review could have a picture and the picture could be of an old bottle. The old bottle could have an old claim. I don't know if anybody's ever been to court, but they take these big boards and they blow them up really big and they point at them. And When's say, the last time you were in court, Patrick? Actually, my my wife did photography in New York City for court reporting. So okay, <laughs> I would think that they would have those as uh, uh, you know big you know projection screens now. But yeah, you're probably so right. Is they don't the allow that stuff. I mean, something physical in the courtroom is yep. probably a better uh, better pull anyway. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so but that's they want that gone. They want that that chain of liability to be gone. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Gentlemen, I appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Patrick, for joining me today, talking about all the, the compliance issues that we ran into uh, uh, over the years here and some of the things that we learned. Uh, certainly, I uh, hope everybody that was uh, in attendance got some, some nuggets out of this and you're taking action uh, before Amazon starts dropping a hammer um, onto your brand or your products. Uh, thank you very much. Have a fantastic day. 
go out and kill it on Amazon or whatever sales channel you're going to, you're on. Take care. Bye all.